Well, good morning. I uh, hope you all are having a, a good Sunday morning so far. Uh, we are still going through the uh, process of getting the uh, new building ready and uh, still in a time frame where we are meeting virtually straight from the office at my home. But uh, here we are. We'll be able to go through uh, the Bible again together, look at the book of Ephesians together, and uh, really looking forward to uh, the time where we can all be together again. I miss you all so much. And uh, it's just still so different being together virtually uh, from when we get to be together in person. And uh, I'm looking forward to being through all of this and being able to be together live and in person rather than live and virtually. But for the time being, still praise the Lord. We praise the Lord that we have the ability to be able to do this, to be able to stay connected through a platform like Facebook, to be able to put the videos up on our YouTube channel, to be able to have people that uh, I'm finding from across our nation already watching uh, and joining in our service, uh, no matter where they are. And uh, that that's an exciting thing. But I'm looking forward to when we are together and uh, when we can do this in person and I can hug on y'all and we can we can just be together and worship and in, in the word. Uh, but until then, praise the Lord, we get to continue doing this. So we'll be looking at the book of Ephesians. We'll be continuing in Ephesians chapter one today. And you can turn there as I go through just a couple of other things. I uh, just want to let you know. Uh, the latest updates on what we are doing still with the building. And uh, we moved out of our old facility this week, uh, got everything prepared so that uh, it, hopefully it's ready to be able to rent, <coughs> excuse me, be able to rent. And uh, John can get someone new in there, but uh, it should all be ready for that. And so all of our stuff is staged to be able to go into the new facility. And this week, uh, we spent a lot of time finishing the sheetrock, getting the, uh, the mud done and getting things ready. And tomorrow uh, I'm going to go and do a light sanding on it and finish some caulk. And at that point, uh, we should be ready to start painting. And in preparation for that, it'll be time to do a really, really good cleaning of the facility to be able to scrape the floors and clean the floors, scrub it, get make sure all the dust is taken care of. And uh, that is something I will sure be able to use your help with. So I'll let you all know, uh, just confirming that we get to that point, hopefully by the end of the day tomorrow. And I will let you all know uh, what's going on. And if any of you are available to be able to come and help with that part of the project, uh, that would be really good. If any of you want to come and help paint, that would be really good too. But we will be ever closer to being able to get our final inspection done and then get our occupancy permit and uh, be ready for when we are able to start meeting again in person. So hopefully that's coming soon. And uh, I will let you know what's going on this week so that any of you that are available uh, can be able to come and help with that. But again, until that time, uh, we're going to continue meeting here uh, just in person on our uh, virtual means. And we will do what we have to do to, to be ready for when we can be together again. So, um, so uh, we're again going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 1 today. And if you want to turn to that book, uh, we will begin looking at our verses. And uh, But let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you so much for what you've done for us. We thank you for the life that you've given us, for the love that you pour out upon us, and for your grace, and for your mercy, and for the joy and the fellowship that we have in and through you. Oh, Lord. No matter where we are this morning, 
how we're apart in our in our own places. Lord, you're still with us. And Lord, I'm grateful for what you've done. I'm grateful that we belong to you. Lord, you are so good. Thank you for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So again, this morning, uh, we will be looking at Ephesians chapter 1. Specifically, we'll be going through Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 12. And the thing that sticks out to me there is a word, redemption. And it's a big word, a word we tend to like as Christians. We tend to like that word redemption. But it's also a word that carries with it a very messy reality, which we tend to want to think of less. Because redemption costs something. The price of redemption was the life of God the Son. It was cost of redemption. The price of redemption meant that Jesus Christ would have to die to buy us with his own blood. And what a sobering and ugly thought, the blood of Jesus Christ. What a sobering and ugly thought that brings with it such joy and beauty. Redemption is a very important word for us to understand. And we'll be looking more at that as we go on today. But last week, we looked at our position in Christ as we went over the first six verses of Ephesians 1. In Ephesians 1.1, it began with Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who were in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. And we talked about how at the point of salvation, God withholds nothing of himself from us. At the point of salvation, God bestows upon us all of himself, all of his mercy, all of his love, all of his grace, all of it is bestowed upon us without reservation at the point of salvation. God withholds nothing of himself from you. God has made us acceptable to him through Jesus Christ. Nothing we deserve, nothing we can earn, but because of his love, we have access to grace. That's our position. That is who we are. And over the first three chapters of this book of Ephesians, Paul's going to continue to expound on that thought. He's going to continue to expound upon it and explain the unexplainable love, grace, and mercy of God. And when we can believe that, when we can rest in that, when we can understand that this is the position of the believer, it's amazing the leaps forward we can make in relationship with the living God. And we have all of that. We have all of that position in Christ, in God, because of redemption. So there's that word again, redemption. Now, let's read through Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, 
having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. The first thought we see in verse 7 is redemption. Redemption in him, in Jesus Christ. We have redemption through his blood. And in verse 7, we see how and why we have access to all of God's love and grace and mercy. Verse 7 says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, there are three Greek words used in the New Testament, all which translate into our one English word or the thought of that word, redemption, bought for a price. <clears throat> there is agorazo used 31 times in the New Testament, which means to purchase from the marketplace to buy or sell. It would be likened to someone going into a market and seeing an item, paying the price to buy it, and then retaining ownership. The main thought behind this word being that you pay for an item, buy it, and you take it out of the market, it's yours. Among other places, this word is used in 1 Corinthians 6, 20, where we are told, for you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Another Greek word is exogorazo, used four times, and it mean, the meaning is similar. It also means to buy out of the market, but specifically it has the connotation, the difference that would be that this word denotes that you are buying this item for yourself or for your own use to keep to never let it go. The first word, agorazo, would allow that you could have bought that item to take somewhere else and sell it at a profit. It's still yours, but it would allow for you to trade it for profit. The second word, exagorazo, however, means that when you buy the item and take it from the market, that you keep it and never sell it again. You keep it for your own use. This is the word used in both Galatians 3.13 and 4.5. In Galatians 3.13, it says that Christ has redeemed us. He bought us for his own use, to keep us. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And in Galatians 4.4 4 and 5, it says, But when the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. You see, he redeemed us. He bought us back to keep us, to make us his own, so much so that we receive the adoption into the family of God. This means that Jesus Christ redeemed us so that we would not ever again be exposed for sale. We would never be changed to someone else's hand. He paid the price. He took us off the market. We belong to him. <clears throat> and the third word used is apolotrusis, used 10 times. And the word used here in Ephesians 1, 7. And the meaning of this word for redemption is to liberate by the pain of a ransom in order to set a person free. That this redemption, this word for redemption means we are absolutely liberated from slavery to sin and we are set free. It's also the word used in Romans 3. In Romans 3, 21 through 26, we are told that now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there's no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness 
that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. We were bought. The ransom was paid so that we would be set free. He justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, the liberation that is in Christ Jesus. What a wonderfully marvelous word redemption is. It not only means to buy an item at the market to own, but it also means that you take it off the market, never to be sold again, to retain for your private use, never to sell it to anyone else. And it also means to set free and liberate after paying the price, the ransom. And the last meaning is more apt to apply to buy to buying someone out of slavery. Now with that intent and in order to set them free, redemption with the intent and in order to set them free. And that's the word we have in Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Like we saw in the passage from Romans 3, man had been sold to sin. All of mankind is born into sin as in, and is in bondage to sin. We are slaves to sin. All have sinned. We were born into a sin nature. And as a result, all of us have a flesh nature to deal with that falls woefully short of the glory of God. And the word used for all have sinned means just that. All of us have sin in our lives that need to be paid, that needed to be paid for. I have sin in my life. You have sin in your life. Everyone that has ever lived, save Jesus Christ himself, had sin or has sin in their lives. And that needs to be taken care of somehow. Sin simply means falling short of the mark, falling short of what God expects for holiness. We have all fallen short of that. And the beauty of the love of God is that Jesus Christ came. His whole purpose in coming was to pay the price for our freedom from that slavery to the sin that we were born into, the sin we carry with us, and the sin we have in our flesh nature. This is what our Lord Jesus was speaking about in John chapter 8. When in John 8, 31, Jesus began with, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And in verse 33 of John 8, they, they answered him, we're Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you shall be made free? And Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Redemption is through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the price he paid. And we are told that he has made us free. He has made us free because of what he's done. The price of redemption was the blood of Jesus Christ. That was the price he paid in order to buy us from sin. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, it says, knowing that you were, were not redeemed with corruptible things. He didn't buy us with silver or gold. We were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. It was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest, made public, was brought forth in these last times for us. First Peter 1.21 says, Who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Let me read that again, verse 20 and 21. He indeed was foreordained, before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith 
and hope are in God. The blood of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice of himself on the cross as the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice. That is what paid the price and bought us back from slavery to sin. And the reason that it was necessary for Jesus to pay for us in this way is that, like it says in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Now, that's true. That's an Old Testament principle. But it's applicable from Adam to the very last man who will ever live and everyone in between. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Forgiveness is not an emotional or sentimental response from God. He doesn't look at us and say, well, you know, he's pretty good. He tried hard. He did mostly good. So he earned forgiveness. I'll go ahead and do that. That would be good. That would be nice. No, forgiveness is not given on sentiment to the exclusion of justice. Justice calls for a sacrifice to be made for the cost of sin. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Isaiah 64.6 tells us that all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. The very best we have to offer God in and of ourselves, our best righteousness, all righteousness that you have, pile it all together, all the righteousness you have, the best you have to offer God in and of yourself, no matter what you do, no matter how you try to earn it, no matter how you try to live, no matter how high you try to make yourself, the best righteousness you have to offer God in comparison to his holiness is a filthy rag. And the word for filthy rag literally means a used menstrual cloth. That's how ugly our best righteousness is. A bloody rag that you could offer him. Here you go. This is my righteousness. Let me have forgiveness. No, the only wages in regard to righteousness we could ever hope to earn by anything we could ever do leads to death. But, oh, praise the Lord, the free gift of God is life, love, grace, mercy, hope, joy, peace, through the redemption we have in Jesus Christ. Forgiveness depends on the shedding of blood. Justice demands payment for the penalty of sin. And through Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood, we have the foundation of forgiveness. Without that, there could be no true forgiveness. What a wonderful gift we have in grace and mercy. God's love is given to us through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. And now we looked at the words for redemption and it involved paying a price, the cost of which was the blood of Jesus Christ. And that through his willingness to pay that price, we have forgiveness of all of our sins. We have forgiveness of all of our sins. We have freedom from slavery to sin because Jesus Christ bought us back himself. God went into the marketplace where we were sold on the slave block of sin, and he bought us, all of us. He paid for all sin for all time. He paid for all of us. And the question is, will you receive the free offer of salvation through the redemption price that Jesus paid? paid or will you choose to remain in slavery to sin that's your choice god will not force you into freedom he allows any who so choose to remain in slavery to sin and try to answer for themselves but he also offers the gift he paid for and offers to us freely freedom 
from the consequences of sin. He paid the redemption price so that we would have that choice. When we choose redemption, then he chooses to keep us for himself. He bought us in order to set us free and establish a personal relationship with us, born of love, redemption and forgiveness, relationship and love. Those are all free gifts that God gives to us. And so there's nothing more that we could ever earn. There's no more salvation you could earn than what God offers freely through grace. There's no more salvation you could ever earn, no matter what you do, than what God offers completely at the point of salvation. In verse 7, the very word used for redemption that we reviewed means that God never asks you what you can do. He never asks you what you have done for him as it comes to forgiveness. That's the glorious thing about grace. The fact that God saves you by grace means it doesn't put you in debt to him. And that's an amazing thing to me. I would think I owe him so much for what he's done for me. He bought you in order to set you free and you could never repay him with just recompense, no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you work on it. There's nothing you could ever do to repay him for what he's already done for you. That is the beauty of grace. God paid the price for you as a free gift born of love. Now, you may ask, wait, aren't we supposed to serve him? James said faith without works is dead, didn't he? Well, absolutely. But that's on another basis entirely. It has nothing to do with earning salvation. That new basis is a new relationship. The relationship now is love, not duty. It's love, not trying to earn something to satisfy the cost of sin. Faith without works is dead should mean we love him so much that we can't help but serve him. Our Lord said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he promised to send us the helper, the Holy Spirit, to do so, to help us serve him. Jesus said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. So if you love him, then he wants your service. If you don't love Jesus, then you shouldn't try to be serving him because without love, it's absolutely meaningless. The greatest gift of all is love. And that's what God wants from us, our love for him. Now you can do all sorts of things for God or in the name of God or because it makes may make you feel better or because you're trying to earn his favor. But the reality is God doesn't want your effort or your stuff. He wants you. He wants a love relationship with you. You were the point of it all. You were the point of it all. All that he did, all that he went through, all that he endured, all the pain that he subjected himself to, the sacrifice he made, the point of it all was you, his love for you. He values and loves you above all else. And he did all that he did and endured all of the pain that he endured because he loves you. And in return, he redeemed us and set us free so that we can choose to love him in return. We can do all sorts of good things, but without love, none of it matters. Now, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, when we were doing our overview of Ephesians as an introduction, we looked at how this church did with the instruction they were given. We looked at Revelation chapter two, <clears throat> excuse me. And in Revelation chapter two, verse one, we're told by John to, that he wrote down to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, 
your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil, that you've tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and you've persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And that first part sounded great. They did the work with labor. They did the work with patience. They did the work with perseverance. They held a sound doctrine. They tested those who spoke up to make sure it lines up with consistency to those things they were instructed through Paul. They listened and took heed to the warnings and instruction of Paul. And they did it all for the sake of the name of the Lord and without growing weary. But they forgot the one thing. They forgot love. They forgot to love the one who mattered most. And the one thing that they forgot was the one thing that mattered most to Jesus. And the church eventually disappeared. The same thing goes in our lives, our families, and those around us. We can do all the right things with labor, patience, and perseverance, trying to earn God's favor and miss out on the most important thing, love God and love others. We see we could have the best of doctrine, faultless theology, great programs to help the poor and needy. We could work like crazy for the Lord. We could have patience and test all things to make sure they line up with scripture. But without love, it means nothing. It's like clanging brass, an abrasive sound. Without love, there's no true lasting value in what we do. Without love for God, we miss out on the one thing that matters the most, the one we do all things for. And like that, actions without love for others are meaningless. Our walk with Jesus is not about duty. It's about relationship. It's not about checking off all the right marks, all the right boxes, and doing all the right things. It's about a living, breathing relationship with the one true and living God. And that's where the church in Ephesus eventually grew cold. They forgot to love the one they were to be following. And in 1 Corinthians, the church in Corinth had asked Paul to tell them and teach them about all the spiritual gifts as they really wanted to be used by God in that way. And Paul did tell them of all the gifts that God has for us, all the gifts of the Spirit, all the ways we could be used by God. And at the end of chapter 12 in 1 Corinthians, after reviewing all that they could be doing, he told them to desire the best gifts desire to be used by God, desire to do things for God. Those are good desires. But he closed out that chapter with these words. And yet I show you a more excellent way. Regardless of what we can do, regardless of all of the ways God could use us, regardless of all of that, Paul spoke of an even more excellent way, something that is even better, something that has far more meaning. And in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, he said, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I've become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, 
I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now I see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. I love that chapter. First Corinthians chapter 13 talks all about what love is. A love relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord, is really the only thing that matters. All else we attempt to do for God, all else we attempt to do to draw near to God, all else we attempt to do on his behalf, all else we attempt to do to earn favor or salvation or to become more godly, unless it's born in love, done in love, and done for the sake of love for God and for others, it's useless clanging of brass. It's an ugly, annoying noise, which tells us the most important thing to God is that love relationship. We are to respond to the price of redemption. We're to respond what it cost God to buy us out of sin with loving gratitude, a love relationship with the living God. Remember, according to verse seven, that we have all we have in redemption and forgiveness is according to the riches of his grace. God has withheld none of himself from us. Now, when we look at that section of scripture, Ephesians 1, 7 through 12, we see three things. In verse 7, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. We see the work of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, on behalf of the church. And it's threefold. Christ redeemed us with his blood. He's revealed the mystery of his will, and he rewards us with an inheritance. Now, we've looked at redemption and what that means, what it costs, and what our response should be. Now, what about this mystery? Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. This is the mystery of God's great plan and purpose that was hidden. But now through Jesus Christ is revealed throughout the New Testament. We have 11 mysteries that get unfolded throughout the New Testament. We'll go over those. We don't have time to go over them all today. But there's 11 different mysteries of God's great plan and purpose that was hidden, but are made manifest through Jesus Christ. And one is revealed here. Paul is calling us to consider the greatness of that plan for the ages and consider our place in that plan. So in the dispensation of the fullness of time, now dispensation is a word which means management, oversight, administration. In other words, God had an ageless plan that he purposed to put in place and he managed it through to completion, all in the proper time that he had ordained for it all to happen. So the mystery re revealed is that God's ultimate plan is to bring together and ultimately resolve all things in Christ Jesus. All things brought together in Christ Jesus. So when someone says all roads lead to God, well, they do. The mystery of God's plan is that he's going to bring all things together in Christ Jesus. Now here's the difference. When we're there, either we will see him and bring, he'll bring all things to G, through Jesus as Jesus Christ as Savior, 
or all things will be brought together through Jesus Christ as judge. That's what's going to happen. All things will be brought before Jesus Christ, and we will either see him as Savior or we will see him as judge. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hand of a righteous God. Justice will be served for sin, for our failings. And either we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, or we stand in our own goodness before God. And fullness of time, when all who are willing are brought in, at some point God's plan will be complete. And the word for gathered together has the idea of to unite, to sum up. It was used for the process of adding up a column of figures and putting the sum up at the top. Paul's idea is that God will make all things add up at the end, and right now he's in the process of coming to that final sum. The day when every wrong will be righted and every matter resolved according to God's holy love and justice, and we will stand before him with either Jesus Christ as Savior or Jesus Christ as judge. And that brings us to the third work here that God the Son will do on behalf of the church. He will reward us with an inheritance. In verse 7, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. What an amazing thing. God rewards us for something we've not done and can never hope to do. He rewards us we become worthy of reward because of Jesus Christ. Part of God's overall purpose and plan for believers is that we will share in Christ's inheritance, that we are adopted in to the family of God. Romans 8, 16 and 17 tells us the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 21 through 23, it says, therefore let no one boast in man, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or, or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. You are Christ's and Christ is God's. What an amazing thing that God says to us here through Paul. Everything is mine. Christ belongs to me because I've been redeemed by Jesus Christ as my Savior. All is mine in Christ Jesus, and all is yours as well. It's all ours because he has chosen to give it to us. Christ is ours. God is ours. What an amazing thing for us as believers, as those who have come to the realization that Jesus Christ is Savior. God has predestined this. He predetermined this. This was part of his plan. He came and paid the price we could not pay so that we could enter into a love relationship with the holy, living God and that through that love relationship, we are grafted into his family and we take part in the reward and the glory, all through God's mercy and through his amazing grace and because of his love. The free gift of salvation that comes at a great cost to God and is given to us freely includes an amazing future and a hope. God predestined that plan. There's nothing I could ever earn and it's something I by no means deserve it's a reward out of his grace and not out of my merit. God never predestined anyone to be lost. He predestined all of us to be with him. He predestined us to receive an inheritance through him. It is our choice to ignore what he has done for us, 
to deny the free gift of salvation offered through grace, and as a result, decline the offer of love, the offer of reward, the inheritance we receive through Jesus Christ. That is up to us. Those are three truly amazing things that Christ has done for us. He's redeemed us with his blood. He revealed the mystery of his will. He rewards us with an inheritance. What an amazing thing. Jesus paid for me. And so I belong to him, born and bound to him by love. God does not exist to satisfy every wish and whim of the believer. The believer exists for the glory of God. When we as believers are living in the center of his will, we have a life of fullness, of satisfaction, of joy, of peace. So that regardless of what's swirling around us, regardless of what is at unrest in the world or what troubles, trials, or tribulations we face, none of that will move you. It is what allows me to say like Paul, but none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I might finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. There is no greater news in all the world than the grace of God. The free gift he gives us of salvation, the redemption that he paid for, that redemption, that ransom he paid for to give us life. We've looked at our position in Christ, our position in grace. We've looked at the work that Christ has done for us. And there's so much more in this letter that we will look at in the coming weeks. But what a place to start. We have a position with God through grace, his free gift to us of salvation, through the price Jesus Christ paid for our redemption buying us back from slavery to sin and death, giving us his love, extending to us his life, grafting us into his very family so that we share in the inheritance of Jesus Christ, mercy, grace, love. What amazing things. And all we need to do to receive it is ask. All we need to do is ask. We are told that when we come to him, we will be by no means cast out. That all it takes for salvation is to look at Jesus Christ and see him for who he is. To confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. To believe in your heart that he's risen from the dead. And we are told at that point, we are saved. That we are saved from the consequences of sin. We are saved from the slavery to sin. And we accept that redemption, that free gift. We accept that from God. We accept what he's offering to us freely. There's really no better deal in all of eternity for any person exchange slavery and death for freedom and life. Grace is free to us. But it costs Jesus Christ everything to extend that deal to us. And he did it joyfully because of his love for you. And what he wants in return is our love for him. There's no greater calling in all the world that you could ever have than to love God because of all that he's done for us. While we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how he showed his love. He died for us when we didn't even know him. He paid for us in full. He's redeemed us at a very high price. And what he looks in return, what he wants in return, is relationship. Relationship with the living God. Relationship with the one who loves you more than you even love yourself. Grace is an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. And you can receive that grace even where you sit right now. All you have to do is ask. All you have to do is submit yourself to God and ask him for his grace, his mercy, and ask him to forgive you. 
and accept the love that he offers you and in return learn how to love him that's a process learning how to love him but there's no greater thing in all the world that you could ever do grace is an amazing thing an amazing thing his love for you knows no bounds let's pray lord jesus we thank you we thank you for all that you've done for us we thank you that you paid the price we could never pay we thank you that you don't require us to earn more of salvation but that you paid it all and oh lord i pray that we would know and realize that cost that we would know and realize how great a love you have for us that we would know and realize the relationship we could have in you that we would know you lord work in our lives help us to love you more as we even cry out like the man who came to jesus and he said i believe help me with my unbelief oh lord that's the same place we all reside we believe Help us with our unbelief. We love. Help us in our areas that we don't love. Because, Lord, we need you. We need you to truly teach us how. May we follow you faithfully. May we grow in love for you. And out of that, may we love each other more. And may we walk in unity before you. What a great God you are. We love you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, if you need prayer, if you have a prayer request, or if you want to know more about what it means to serve Jesus Christ, then drop us a note. Just send us a message even here through Facebook. Uh, if you can send us a private message, we'd be happy to pray for you. We'd be happy to pray with you. We would be happy to just know you better. So if there's a prayer request you have, or if you want to know more about Jesus Christ, then drop us a note, drop us a private message, and we would be happy to respond to you. Now, I pray that this week that you just spend time meditating on what it means to love God. If that's what's most on his heart, if that's what's most on his heart for our lives, then I think that's something we should be spending time meditating on. What does it mean to love God and learn how to have a relationship with him, not born of duty, but born of love? Anyway, I can't wait to see you all. I'm really looking forward to that. I will uh, uh, text uh, all of you that, that are asking for uh, the continued communication about what's going on with the building and let you know what's going on this week. And if there's uh, ways for you to help to prepare the building for us to move into. And I, I will let you all know. And if you have time to do that, that would be great. But regardless, I love you all. I look forward to seeing you. And if you need prayer, again, I would encourage you to drop a line to us. God bless you guys. Have a great week.